Hi, I'm Chris Kramer. I'm a faculty member here in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Minnesota. After this initial welcome piece, I plan to dispense with the video. I'll still have a voiceover, but otherwise the only thing on the screen will be presentation materials. However, I did want to take this opportunity to look people in the digital eye and say welcome, and I hope you find this useful. So after the title slide, how do I like to see a talk organized? What do I think is uh, effective? So one thing I don't like, and maybe this is my personal bias, I don't like an outline. I think an outline is sort of silly. Are you expecting someone to leave and you wanted to let them know what they were going to miss? You're about to give your talk. Why are you going to tell people ahead of time what it is you're talking about? There they are. Just give your talk. I really like to start with sort of big picture introductory material. Why should someone outside your research group care about what you've been doing. And at some level, this is uh, also how you start writing a paper or you start writing a proposal. Why should anybody care? What is the motivating factor that gives rise to the research you're about to present? Uh, I also think that if you've got data or analysis that's going to rely on some particular instrument technique, something that is not incredibly well known to everyone in your audience, uh, you should attempt to explain that, but on the other hand, you may decide that it is so specialized or so difficult a technique to explain all the details of that you don't think you can do it in the time you have available, in which case you should do your best, again, to come up with sort of a Jethro explanation that is going to be respectful and helpful to the audience, but uh, you just ask them to trust you that uh, there are some details that are so technical you don't want to spend time on them, and usually an audience is going to be uh, accommodating in that regard. At, after that stage, so you've now set the stage to talk about what you yourself did, and uh, there are narrative results, and if you've got a lot of results and you want to make conclusions along the way to help guide people, I often think that's a good idea. So interim conclusions if they're helpful, more results, more conclusions. Then I think you should circle back to your big picture and you know tie up your talk in a ribbon. It's also great in many instances to talk about what's next. So um, you know many talks people finish and it looks like everything's done, at least to young scientists, they don't necessarily see that it's open perhaps opened up as many questions as were answered. And uh, it's fun to, to pose those sorts of what's next questions. It helps to launch discussion after a talk often. So I'm going to try to uh, maybe illustrate that in this talk in a certain way, but we'll see that as we go along. OK, so uh, the big picture introductory material. And I will tell you that students, uh, and the younger they are, the more this is true, they really like this. So even though they are uh, not necessarily perfectly expert and won't follow all the rest of the things that you speak about, they're going to remember they learned something new. They're going to get a big picture perspective and maybe they'll be drawn in further the next time that that happens. And so, for instance, when I would provide such a big picture summary, I might, I might do this. So I, I often have slides when I give introductory lectures that will be called a one-slide summary of and so my particular area of expertise is computational chemistry, sometimes called theoretical chemistry, molecular modeling. And this Venn diagram is sort of a simple way, and I'm not going to give you my talks, I just want to show sort of example slides, uh, of explaining what is computational chemistry, why do you use it, where are the places that it uh, plays a role in research, and it attempts to sort of place it in a context of experimental chemistry, computational chemistry. This particular slide I often go into history as well, and uh, it sets a stage. This is another introductory slide I often use when I'm uh, giving a research talk on the uh, reactivity of mono copper containing uh, small molecules when they react with molecular oxygen. And part of the motivation is that there are metalloenzymes that do interesting chemistry in living organisms. And because of those metalloenzymes, inorganic chemists want to make small molecule models that can accomplish that interesting chemistry as well. And so people often uh, see that sort of a connection that, okay, there's a biological motivation that leads to a chemical investigation and a modeler may provide insight. Uh, that would be the part that I would be talking about in my talk. And then I'll offer one more uh, final sort of slide I like as a big picture slide. And I'm, I'm, I guess what I'd like to, you to take home from these slides is there's, sort of, there's not enormous amounts of detail on these slides. They're big pictures. They try to be sort of colorful. 
Uh, this is an example of a dye-sensitized solar cell, so it probably has the most detail of the three slides that I've shown you up till now. But one can uh, use this slide to explain, A, there's a massive uh, energy crisis on Earth. We all need more energy. Uh, how might one go about harvesting energy? Here's a proposal that captures solar energy and turns it into fuels. Certainly any audience can sort of understand at that level. And then I dive a little more deeply into the chemistry and explain what's, what's happening. And there is a device, if you will, that's shown here in a schematic. And uh, the next step is for me to start talking about which parts of the device a computational chemist plays role in modeling. Uh, and I guess I have one last introductory slide that I sort of like. This is yet another area of research that comes out of my group, and it uh, has to do with the development of certain kinds of models that predict free energies of salvation and other sorts of uh, thermodynamic quantities. And if you're going to talk about thermodynamic quantities to a, a chemistry audience, it's helpful to actually have sort of specific examples. So here's an intro slide that explains to people what is a free energy of salvation and how when it's uh, salvation of a gas molecule into itself as a pure liquid phase, even though it's the same, uh, the same thermodynamic quantity, we usually refer to it in different units and we call it a vapor pressure. And then between two solvents, it's a partition coefficient and that plays a role in uh, dr the drug industry in uh, predicting bioavailability, for instance. So again, big pictures, bright colors, an attempt to uh, explain why this research is going to be important in a very general context. Okay, so uh, after the introductory slides, what, what might we want to do next? And I mentioned that if you want to discuss instruments, techniques, and the like, you might want to try to get that across. And so here's an example from my field where I want to explain how to do, how, how free energies of salvation are used, and I, I start with trying to give you a big picture idea of what a computational chemist uh, brings to a chemistry game, and that is thinking about so-called potential energy surfaces, and this is a talk about how to give talks. I'm not going to try to explain potential energy surfaces to you, but this is a graphical representation in some sense of how you connect from one kind of a concept, a gas phase concept, to a solvated concept, and it illustrates where the free energy of salvation comes in. So not a lot of technical detail here, but explaining that we have a relationship between the gas phase and solution that's connected by this quantity, and things that chemists are interested in, equilibrium constants, rate constants, we can determine those relating them between these two different kinds of phases, gas and solution. Now this is a slide that's bordering on what I might call the, the busy aspect. If I were giving it to a totally general audience, I probably wouldn't use this slide. If I'm talking to physical chemists, this is sort of the, the level of uh, technical detail that may in fact be useful. And so it includes equations, and uh, I would say if you do have equations, it, you are obligated to explain those equations and make sure that they're clear, and I'll, I'll say more about that perhaps in a second. Um, you don't want too much on any one slide, and you, you would like to try to turn the equations into conceptual ideas. So you see there are some graphics on here that illustrate uh, what, what, if you like, happens from manipulating quantities from a more conceptual standpoint. And again, I don't want to dive too much into chemistry, so I won't talk about electrostatic potentials and partial atomic charges, but this would be the sort of thing that would inform follow-on discussion this is what's required to generate the data. Now I'm going to talk to you about data, and uh, you will understand where those data came from. And I'll, I won't feel like a complete charlatan because I showed you how it was done, but you don't want to delve too deeply into it in, unless you're really talking to theory developers. So along those lines, let me uh, mention a pet peeve, and this is really more for, uh, I don't know, theoretical modelers in general. It doesn't have to be chemistry. And I'm just going to say, if you can't explain an equation fully, and by that I mean every single term in your equation should either be obvious to your audience or you should mention what it is. Otherwise, why did you put it there? Uh, you know, you occasionally do really need to have an equation. It's fundamental to your talk, but then take the time to explain it. And so I offer the observation here that half your audience disappears with each equation that uh, fails to have an adequate explanation. They feel a bit lost, and as they ponder that puzzle of what exactly did you mean, you flash another equation, and they didn't even have time to listen to you at that stage. So it's your job. You're the presenter. Make the equation seem intuitive. Get people in the audience to nod their heads and, and say, oh, yes, I see that. 
And uh, I say this as a theoretician, I sit through synthetic organic talks sometimes and see reagent acronyms flash by in large mobs. Uh, unless you know you're talking to an all synthetic audience, that's not very helpful. You should expand those acronyms. Uh, spectra with unexplained features and so forth. And I, I guess, you know, to sum it up, if you put it on the slide, you must have thought it was important, so maybe you should explain it. And if you didn't put it on the slide, then you don't have to say much about it. So don't put things on slides just to show off how smart you are. It's, it's not a good idea. So for instance, here's one of my favorite equations. This is actually in supporting information of a paper I wrote once, but I would never want to include it in a presentation. It looks very impressive, but is it interesting? No, it's really just uh, an exercise in equation editor. Uh, quite beautiful from that standpoint, but a waste of time in your talk. All right, some technical things to uh, discuss. Uh, you, you've seen, as I've gone through here, I actually like bulleted text. I think it helps guide the audience in terms of moving along and thinking about what you're saying. I like to keep slide backgrounds simple, and uh, you know the wallpaper in the background is not what you want people focused on. You actually want them to be paying attention to the science you're describing. So if you like to use lots of animations and appear and disappear things, my advice is to keep it simple. Uh, my, when my children were young, they certainly liked to have presentations in their grade school where things exploded and tanks came driving in and towing things behind them and garish fireworks went off. Uh, there is an age where that's interesting, but I would say that uh, after a certain stage, there is no longer that age. So try to be professional. Uh, font sizes. So. I have a recommendation here that you don't use less than 14 point on a landscape slide and really only that small save for citations. If it doesn't all fit on a slide, you've got too much on a slide. You, you're hoping for a large audience in a large room unless you know ahead of time it's a very small audience and then maybe you can uh, adjust. But uh, you know, if people can't see things in the back rows and they're often the people who need it most, you know, the students, they always go to the back of the auditorium and they're the ones you'd really like to speak to. Uh, so be sure that the message gets across to every point in the room. And of course, when you practice, it's great to go in a room, put your slides up, walk to the back of the room, and make sure that you can see them all. Uh, so here's an example of flying things in. I'm going to show you a slide that in the end is kind of busy, but by using animation, it's, it's not so bad. Uh, and so I'm now going to show a cursor here on the screen. So I, I need to show a lot of data on one slide. And what I do is I start and I say, okay, this level of theory, and I would explain to you what CRCC was if this was a real talk, delivers some results. And I'm going to use these results as a benchmark. So I have this energy scale and I've got these uh, lines here that represent a benchmark. And then I'll talk about another theory and talk about how it does. It's got its own lines and I have these dotted lines that are helping you see the benchmark numbers come across. And you can talk about differences in numbers, for instance. And then there's some more theories that I'm interested in, and they all have their own results. And oh, look, something happened here. I've got some bold face lines and some not bold face lines. So then I have something come in that uh, reminds me to tell you, ah, well, this is what a bold line means, and this is what a, a thin line means, and I spend some time on that. And then finally, now that you understand all the notation, I'll give you the rest of the results. And it ends up that uh, this slide now contains a lot of information, but by taking it a bite at a time, and I really do need to sort of see all the information on one slide, I haven't run into the problem that often if you just flashed it all up at once, audience members will begin puzzling for themselves. Wow, what does all that mean? And, and unfortunately, as they puzzle that and they focus on their, their visual input, they reduce their attention to their auditory input, and they don't necessarily hear what you're saying so well, and then at the end of the slide, they're confused. They're not sure what really happened. So you want to try to use the animations to guide the discussion so they're focused on the, each point as it comes up, as you think it's important. Uh, tables. So certainly lots of presentations that include data have tabular data. And here's my attitude about tabular data. Is there a number in your table that you don't plan to mention? Well, then why do you need to display it? So tune, don't just cut a table out of some other place, like a research paper or what have you. Tune the tables in your presentation to match the point you're trying to get across. Reduce the data if that's effective. Again, bigger fonts are better. You want people to be able to see it. And use the opportunity of a presentation to highlight important data. Again, draw attention where you want it. You can do that with a laser pointer, of course, but you can also do it with the graphics within your presentation software. And I like keeping borders clean and simple. That's just a general rule for slides, I think. So here's what I regard as an OK table. 
Uh, it's got a lot of numbers in it, and it's got some citations on the page here. This is the 14-point font I was mentioning. And uh, there are different colors, and there's some bold face, and there's some not bold face. And in the course of explaining this slide, I would tell you what these colors meant, and hopefully it would reinforce for the audience as they absorb all the numbers uh, what's going on, what's the point I'm trying to get across. A poor table is one that looks like this. So this is another uh, table. These are salvation-free energies uh, because this really does come from a research talk. So this is a talk where, for a certain reason, I chose to include a poor table. I'll, I'll talk about when you get to violate your rules later. But there's just too much data here. It's, it's highly unlikely. I'm actually planning to go line by line and explain why there are these hundredths digits and go into uh, numbers at this level of detail. So probably I could reduce this. So here's a table I like best in a sense. It's only got eight numbers in it. And moreover, it's a table that is accompanied by conceptual ideas. It's not just the numbers. So here, for instance, it's an attempt to predict pKa's for uh, carbonic acid and bicarbonate. So that molecule has two pKa's, two ionizable centers. And I've got different ways to compute it based on including some specific water molecules in a calculation. And this illustrates how those water molecules are interacting with the molecule. And oh, look, this green water, well, that's the first water. And the red water, oh, look, this row is red. So that helps an audience to focus on how does the picture relate to the data, relate to the numbers that are trying to get across. And finally, here's the take home message that I want you to get from the slide. I get better accuracy. These last numbers, the blue numbers, are closest to the experimental numbers, and uh, hopefully, you know, that cements a message all in one slide. Numbers, concepts, everything.